My name is John Sandloss. I'm an Associate Professor of History at Memorial University of Newfoundland and currently I'm a Fellow at the Rachel Carson Centre. My research area is the historical and contemporary impacts of abandoned mines on native communities in northern Canada. Uh, my research team looks in particular at the social, environmental and economic consequences of these mines for native communities in, in the region. Most of the mining that, that uh, occurred in northern Canada began in the 1930s um, and so really our time period is, is throughout the middle of the 20th century up to the late 20th century. But one of the things that we found very, very interesting about abandoned mines in northern Canada is, is that they have impacts that have resonated and are really environmental questions right up to the present day. Many of them have left long-term legacies of, of chemical impacts, toxins and whatnot, landscape changes and other types of impacts that must be addressed in the present day and into the future. My particular research, I, we have a large research team, but my particular research has been on Giant Mine, which is a large-scale gold mine uh, that was established in 1948 uh, next to the capital city of the Northwest Territories, which is Yellowknife. And the issue at Giant Mine was arsenic. Arsenic was being pumped out of a smokestack the gold ore had to be roasted to separate the gold out from the surrounding rock and this resulted in a fine dust being sent up this, this smokestack and spread out into the local environment. This had a particularly negative impact on local First Nations in the area because many of them relied upon uh, snow or local waterways such as lakes and rivers for their drinking water. And if you can imagine in the long northern Canadian winter, arsenic is settling the, in the dust pound after pound of it, day after day, this dust is just accumulating. There's no thaw, there's no rain to wash it away. And then all of a sudden in the spring, all this snow melts and the local rivers, the local streams, local ponds even, and certainly local lakes get this big dose of arsenic, uh, which is highly toxic to human beings. And, and this had a particularly dramatic impact for native communities in the region. Right now, Giant Mine is the largest toxic cleanup site in Canada, period. The problem was when you use a form of technology to solve one pollution problem, namely arsenic air pollution, you sometimes can create other pollution problems. Um, when, when they caught the dust coming up the smokestack in pollution control equipment, it didn't disappear, it had to go somewhere. And the solution was, uh, what the mining company did, was they started to pump that arsenic dust underground. They were pumping between uh, 10 and 16 tons of it per day. Now, 237,000 tons of this material sits underground. And if groundwater were to ever come up, and enter these chambers and then be released back into the local environment into uh, Great Slave Lake is the large lake adjacent to Yellowknife. It would be a public health catastrophe, it would be an environmental catastrophe and, and so on and so forth. What the Government of Canada has proposed to do, there's a remediation project that's currently undergoing environmental assessment and what the Government of Canada has proposed to do is use what's called thermosiphon technology which is basically passive heat exchange uh, and they would freeze each of these chambers so that groundwater can't get in. There's only one problem and it is a very big problem and that is that first of all the site would have to be maintained and cared for in perpetuity for all time and that would involve pumping water forever, that would involve presumably inspections of the site forever and some kind of staffing presence again for all eternity. You know, it's, it's hard to imagine in a hundred thousand years will there be a Canadian government? Will there be a line item in the budget for, uh, for this kind of perpetual care and maintenance? And also there's the problem of communicating with future generations about this toxic hazard. It's, it's exactly like nuclear waste. How do you tell people 20,000, 30,000 years in the future that there's this massive toxic liability under the ground? So there's this whole issue of fulfilling an ethical obligation to future generations, ideally not leaving them with this toxic liability, but at the very least communicating with them about the danger.